By the term set, we mean a well-defined collection of objects, typically mathematical objects. To set some notation, if we're given a predicate p of x, we can get a set from the collection of all objects x in a universe that make p of x true. We indicate this using set builder notation, s equals, then we use braces to decide the set. We list the form of the object, the colon means such that, and then we list the predicate that will be true for all the objects in the set. In shorthand, we often write that s equals the collection of x such that p of x is true. We'll use the notation a is in s to mean that p of a is true. Similarly, we'll use the notation a is not an element of s to mean p of a is false. These are the only two possible situations. To recap, the first symbol, a is an element of s, and the second symbol, a is not an element of s. Let's see an example. Consider the set E equals the set of X such that X equals 2N for some integer N. The predicate is the statement X equals 2N for some integer N. The value N is quantified, but the variable X is free. So we can use different numbers to plug into X to see if they're in the set. For instance, let's consider X equals 10. We know that 10 equals two times five and five is an integer. So that means that 10 is an element of E. On the other hand, if we consider x equals 21, we see that 21 is not twice any integer, and therefore 21 is not an element of e. Let's check a couple more. Let's consider the real number x is pi. Well, this is not twice any integer either, and therefore pi is not an element of e. Finally, a number like x equals 208 is 2 times 104, and 104 is an integer, so, 208 is an element of E. Careful consideration of the set E shows us that the set E is the set of all even integers. Try this out yourself. Use set builder notation to describe the set of odd integers. Let's look at some examples where you've used sets before, but might not have used set theoretic notation. When studying algebra and precalculus, you often look at equations like y equals 4x plus 5. Typically, the idea is to graph this equation to see that it looks like a line. But really what you're doing is you're looking at a bunch of ordered pairs of dots in the plane, these blue dots, and it turns out that they all lie along the line. So what you're really doing is you're graphing the set of ordered pairs of the form x comma y such that the equation y equals 4x plus 5 is true. That means the equation y equals 4x plus 5 becomes the predicate of the set in question. Another algebraic question is to solve the equation x squared minus 5x plus 6 equals 0. We know this has a graphical interpretation, but what we're looking for is we're looking for the x values where this graph crosses the x-axis. We see that there are two such points. Therefore, we're looking for the collection of all x such that x squared minus 5x plus 6 equals 0, and in this case, this is just the set containing the numbers 2 and 3. Since sets are built from predicates and predicates are related to propositions, it makes sense that there will be set theoretic interpretations of the logical connectives. Let A and B both be sets. We can depict A and B with circles that are labeled by the appropriate letter. Now we can create new sets using three elementary set connectives. First, the union of A and B, denoted A union B, is the collection of X such that X is in A or X is in B. This is the set theoretic interpretation of the OR statement. Next is the intersection of A and B, denoted A intersect B. This is the collection of X such that X is in both A and B. This is the set theoretic interpretation of the AND statement. And the final elementary connective is the difference of a by b, denoted a set minus b, which is the collection of x that are in a and not in b, pictured on the left here. You can think of this as the collection of things that are only in a and not in b. As a final note here, it's interesting to see that the union of a and b can be split into three pieces that have nothing in common. 
On the left we have the set A set minus B, in the middle we have A intersect B, and on the right we have B set minus A. Therefore A union B is the union of these three sets, and none of them have anything in common. We call this a disjoint union. Let's look at one more set operation, as well as the Venn diagram for three sets. The different set connective is strongly related to the not connective from logic. The complement of a set A in a universe U is the collection A bar, which is the set U set minus A. This represents the collection of all the things that are in the universe and not in A, as pictured here. With this language, we can draw a three set Venn diagram and see that it encloses eight possible regions. So let's look at a universe U. And inside, let's have three sets A, B, and C that possibly overlap. First, we have the set of just the things in A and not in the union B, C, and C. We also have the collection of things that are only in B and not in A union C. And we have the collection of things that are in C only and not A union B. We can then look at the collection of objects that are in A and B, but not in C. It forms this little rocket region at the top. And we have three more similar regions. We have the things in A and C, but not in B. And then we have the objects that are in B and C and not in A. But now we also have to consider the objects that are in all three sets, A intersect B intersect C, and this forms the Rouleau triangle in the middle. That's seven regions, and so the eighth region are the collection of things in the universe that are not in any of the sets, or the complement of A union B union C pictured here. Can you draw a proper four-set Venn diagram that will enclose 16 regions? To find a set-theoretic interpretation of the conditional connective, let's introduce the subset relation. We say that a set A is a subset of another set B if every element of A is also an element of B. That means the Venn diagram looks like this, where A is completely contained in B. For notation, we say A is a subset of B, and we can interpret this logically as for all x, if x is in A, then x is in B. So the subset relation is a direct translation of the conditional along with a universal statement. Let's see an example. Let's list all of the subsets of the finite set containing the numbers 1, 2, and 3. First, we have the subsets with one element like the one containing 1, the one containing 2, and the one containing 3. Then we have the subsets containing 1 and 2, the subset containing 1 and 3, and the subset containing 2 and 3. And every set is a subset of itself by definition, so we have the subset 1, 2, 3. It turns out there is one more interesting set, and that's the set with nothing in it, which we call the empty set and denote using this symbol here. So there are eight subsets of the set 1, 2, 3. We can use the subset relation to define set equality. We say A equals B if and only if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. So the equality relation between sets is actually a direct translation of the biconditional connective. Let's finish this video with a final method of creating a new set from two sets known as the Cartesian product. Given two sets A and B, which we'll show here as ellipses, we create the Cartesian product A times B as the collection of all ordered pairs of the form A comma B where A is in A and B is in B. As an example, we've listed five elements in A and three elements in B. So to build the Cartesian product, we need to pair up every single element of A with every single element of B. And so we see R pairs with one, two, and three, S pairs with one, two, and three, T pairs with 1, 2, and 3, L pairs with 1, 2, and 3, and N pairs with 1, 2, and 3. This creates the entire Cartesian product. By the cardinality of a set A, we just mean the number of elements in the set A, and we denote it by putting two bars on either side of the set A. I'll leave you with a final exercise. Can you find a formula for the cardinality of the Cartesian product A times B in terms of the cardinalities of A and B?